Hello, Sales Nation. I'm your host, Will Barron, and welcome to another episode of the Salesman Podcast. On this show, we have Suzanne Ruan, and we're talking about how to work her room, which is the title of a mega best-selling book. This has sold so many copies, and it's an excellent resource for salespeople. Um, how to Work a Room is the title. You can buy that on Amazon and on Suzanne's website, which is over at suzannerowan.com. Everything that we talk about and all these links are available in the show notes at salesman.red, as always. And yeah, absolutely a pleasure to interview Susan. She's an absolutely lovely lady. I got a lot from the interview. and I know you guys will as well. Just before we jump into the interview itself, just a reminder that if you leave a review on iTunes, dead simple, if you're in the, YouTube, if you're in the iTunes app, um, just go to, yeah, click on the, the logo, click on review, leave a review, drop me an email, and we'll send you out a bunch of stickers and a quick thank you note from me, myself. So with all that said, let's jump into today's show with Suzanne. Hi, Susan, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Well, I'm delighted to be here, Will. Good stuff. I'm delighted to have you here, Susan. And I mentioned this before we start recording, but I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. And you can tell me your, your thoughts and whether this is true or not. But I think from my experience, working the room and networking in person and selling in person is something that some millennials have shied away from in my experience when I've, I've worked with them and, and helped them and, and done different bits with the show and met up with them in person. And they perhaps like to hide a little bit behind email, behind the phone, and they are less inclined to go to conferences, events, and that, that kind of thing to make these initial contacts. And my experience, so I used to work in medical device sales. Regular listeners will know this. We talk about it all the time on the show. And I got most of my leads that went into the top of my funnel by being in hospital theaters, dealing with one surgeon, and then another surgeon will come in the room or you'll go to the, the coffee room or you'll go out for lunch with them and there'll be other surgeons there and you are networking and working the room with them. A lot of my colleagues would just stick with the guy that they were with and that they've been invited with, whereas I'd go off, have a wander, have a chat with people, make new contacts, and it always did tremendous for me. So with that to start with, Susan, do you see any difference between how often and how well perhaps millennials, and obviously this is could go on, for, we could use any group of people, but millennials specifically, do they work a room better or worse or more or less than perhaps the generations or the senior management positions that people are in at the moment? Well, I would have to say they don't work a room, but <laughs> um, that's just casting an aspersion on a generation. Uh, mm -hmm. What we find is people today, millennials and other generations are all hiding behind email, checking people out on LinkedIn, finding Facebook, going to Instagram. A lot of people are hiding behind the devices when truly what you just said, if you have the opportunity to be face to face with a room full of people who potentially could be clients or referrals to clients or someone who knows someone who might know someone and you choose not to be there, you cut yourself off from possibilities. It's not that every conference, convention, surgical theater will have someone that will turn into the next best client, but most of them will if you talk to them. You know, people say, what's the magic? And I say, how about talking to people? This, you know, it's nothing different than my very wise grandmother would say, which was, be nice to people, go over to them, talk to them. and the smart salespeople that are really successful combine both will. They do what they need to do online, if that's how the client or prospect prefers, but they also show up in that face-to-face -face space because there's something different and magical that happens when you share a conversation, a smile, information. There's that connection that is so different than an online connection. So we're going to dive into what is different and how this, as you described it, magical thing can happen when you meet with an individual in person. Before that, I just want to reaffirm something with you. So in the world of entrepreneurship, there's a, an overly cliched term of, which I think is true, though, of your network is your net worth. Do you think that this 
scales for salespeople and just people in general as well? Well, it's so funny. You, you make me laugh because when I read that now, I've been in this business long enough that I did a workshop at San Francisco State University called Your Network is Your Net Worth or <laughs> Upgrade Your Net Worth via Your Network. So it's like those, that thought has been around a long time. And mm -hmm. the answer is, of course, you know, when we look at what our riches are, uh, some of it's really the dollars in the bank. But the other one is having people who are sources and resources that you could call on at any time. That's really what's rich. In fact, when Dr. Tom uh, Stanley, who was at Georgia State University, before he wrote the book, The Millionaire Next Door, he did a lot of research on millionaires. And what he found in the 80s, the number one trait in common for millionaires, and that's when millions were a lot of money. Oh, but I'm mm -hmm. kidding. It still is. Uh, what he found they had in common, because he studied millionaires, was one thing. They had huge Rolodexes. And a Rolodex, of course, we say we don't use that term anymore, but we really use it as a metaphor for meaning that array of contexts that you have. They had huge Rolodexes. They knew who were in them, they could pick up the phone and call the people they knew, and A, the person would take the call or return it immediately. So yes, having that base of people who know you, and it, this is an old cliche, it's not, I learned it from my, shall we say, networking teacher, Sally Livingston, many years ago, it is not what you know, we knew this in Chicago where I'm from, it's who you know. And it's more importantly, third part, who knows you? Because if someone mm -hmm. has an idea for um, that they met someone that could buy your whatever you're selling, if they don't remember you, well, then you haven't done your job. It doesn't matter that you know them, but when it comes to them referring to you, if they don't know you, but they know your competitor, you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to go to the top of mind, aren't they? Exactly. So it's, and it's not amassing a huge, I know this is going to just slay all the people that have, <laughs> but I actually wrote this. It's not having a million people on your subscriber list. It's really having people who you know and who know you. Subscriber lists are important, but having people who can consciously, in part of a conversation, access your name and who you are and what you do to recommend you and refer you to other people, that's gold. And that's your net worth. There's two things I want to dive into here. First off, I want to mention that The Millionaire Next Door, I read it recently. And for anyone who's listening, obviously people work in sales, they're, they're money-minded. They are probably on the hunt to become a millionaire maybe, but to become financially secure for sure. And it's a great resource. We'll link to it in the show notes of this episode as well. And from that, I just want to, I want to, I want to emphasize. Well, it's, it's two ways I can emphasize this. Uh, with a question in a second, but as you're on about lists of contacts and that kind of thing, we have made a massive conscious effort, and it's happened for the first nine months that we've been going as the podcast and as the blog. Every single person that drops the email address in on our website gets an email from either me or Sarah, the producer, or Dom, who was the producer before that. One of us will email in, connect with that person, and convert us from being, oh, you drop your email on the site and we'll give you a weekly update to, hey, I'm interacting with this guy that I listen to every day. This is really cool. We've only stopped doing it the past week just because I've not had a chance to catch up with them. So <laughs> anyone who's subscribed the past week will, will get an email from me at some point when I get back on top of everything. But that's how much I care about this. And coming back to uh, the the point here and why I want to emphasize for millennials specifically, our audience, the importance of those face-to-face -face interactions rather than getting an introduction over email or phone. From your perspective, Susan, do you think that a first impression and an initial introduction, even if it's a cold one in person, has way more value than a cold email or a cold phone call. I definitely do. And I'm so glad you said first impressions because I'm so proud of this. 
CNN.com UK did a whole article yesterday on first impressions. I'm going to send you the link. And they quoted me in my book. I mean, I wrote her like 10 tips, but she included a couple of them. <laughs> um, that first impression is important. But I'm going to say something that I told you would be counterintuitive. What we want to do, whether you're a millennial or, you know, Gen X, Y, Z, everywhere you show up, you really have to think, what impression am I going to give? I know now everyone talks about what's my brand, but what do you want to stand for? What do you want people to see? And that's where we really have to comport ourselves, is certainly professionally as salespeople, in mm-hmm. that manner. But I'm going to suggest something that I, I also wrote in What Do I Say Next? Let's give people also the second chance. There are some people, Will, who make a great first impression but we all know someone that after we get to know them a little bit that we think, oh, my God, what a jerk. <laughs> so really, that person who doesn't make the best first impression on you could be one of those 90% of people who think of themselves as shy. They could be nervous. They could think of themselves as an introvert. They could have just found out some news that was distracting and disappointing. So, yes, we all want to make a good first impression. And the second part is the Susan Rowan version, and I even wrote it in How to Work a Room, give people a second chance. Because you never know at what juncture in time you caught them. But making a first impression that's positive, that's upbeat, that shows you're interested in people, it's not magic. I know that people wonder, how can I be charming? People love people who are interesting, but they really love people who are interested. And mm-hmm. being a good listener, how about this? Every time I do a program, I don't care if it's with CEOs or salespeople or if I did a program at a school with sixth graders. You make it easy for people to approach you when you have a smile on your face and have eye contact with people. So what we do at any event face-to-face is make sure that we have like a face that looks like we're happy to be there. You know, I, I say this in my talks always. Nobody walks over to the person that looks like they're having bunions and corns and that their face is excruciating looking and says oh look there's a glowering unhappy person i want to meet we want to meet the people that look like they want to meet us so this is going to be very simple you don't even have to write this down just remember this susan says smile and have eye contact make it easy for people to talk to you and by the way when you go over to the people if you're smiling Here's what we think. Oh, my God, that person's so smart. They want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And and Susan, I'm going to jump in here because I want to come on to the practical aspects of all this because that's what people want to know. And and they seem like easy wins. But before we get to the the practical of to approach someone, you do X, Y, Z and that kind of thing. If that exists, I'm not sure. I want to come on to the mindset. So you mentioned it then. And a lot of people myself included uh, as a younger salesperson was ne- I, I was nervous when i walk into a room i would do i remember one event at the first company i worked for in, in a sales position walked into the room i very consciously remember seeing one person that i knew i latched onto them and then i didn't network with anyone it was a massively wasted opportunity and the company had paid great money to put on this conference to get the potential customers and good customers there. And I remember feeling like a massive failure afterwards. And looking back at it, it was silly for me to be scared because no one's going to, the practicality and the reality of it is nobody's going to club you over the head with something for saying hi and trying to get a conversation going. And they almost expect you to, if it's a corporate event like that. But yeah, tell us more about why people get nervous about this. Well, I just alluded to it when Dr. Philip Zimbardo, who was at the Stanford Stanford University, studied shyness. He found in the 80s that 80% of us self-identify as shy. Uh, Because walking into a room full of people we don't know, which is my, shall we say, my my theme, Mm -hmm. is uncomfortable. We think, well, why are we here? What are we going to talk to them about? And yet, 
our careers and our personal lives are based on walking into a room full. Could it be a party? It could be a holiday party. It could be a wedding. It could be a, a fundraiser. It could be going to a victory party for your favorite team. But when you walk into a room full of people you don't know, 90% of us are uncomfortable. Why, it, why is that, though? And I want to drill down to this because it's so it's silly when you talk about it, but then most people don't think I'll talk about it. Because if most people in there are feeling uncomfortable, but you're obviously there because you want to network or speak to and meet new people, then that sounds just massively counterintuitive and, and daft as a concept. Why, if everyone knows that, why aren't they being proactive about it and, and getting over it? But it's not really daft as a concept. What it is is you have to go to back to the social science research. People think of themselves as shy, and you'd be really surprised. Some of the people who think of themselves as shy, I know I did this research for my book, What Do I Say Next, are people that I thought were outgoing, but they think they're shy. They are uncomfortable because we don't know people. We don't know what to say to them. We don't know what we like. And here's the other part, and this is part of how to work room. When we walk into a room full of people we don't know, that old thing that we were raised with was don't talk to strangers is in the back of our heads. Um, now, the smart thing to know is, and I'm glad you brought this up, if according to research, it's now 80 to 90 percent of the people in that room are also uncomfortable, you need to know that because it doesn't matter if you're a millennial or if you're Gen X, Y, or Z. <laughs> you walk into that room, and the most important thing to know is your clients, your potential clients, uh, the potential, you know, the bosses, whoever could refer business to you, the surgeons, whatever, they are also 90% shy. So whatever you can do, because you've listened to this wonderful podcast, whatever you can do to go over, and how about this very basic word, just be friendly will help dissolve their shyness and discomfort. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give everyone a different way of looking at going into any room, any event. Instead of worrying about your own discomfort, I want you to turn it around, and this is your new job. Think of, what can I do to make other people comfortable with me? When you do that, you will extend yourself. You will be friendly. You will be open. And the other person who might be that 90% shy, and that's 90% of us, will feel more comfortable, will feel more at ease, will be more open. And then you're in a conversation because you've made them comfortable, they're comfortable, now you're more comfortable, and off you go. So really, it's, I agree with you, it's, you're there to do business, but if your inner guts are, oh my God, I'm so nervous, <laughs> this will help you overcome it. And to know that you're not alone, I'm going to tell you, in a lot of decades of speaking on how to work a room, the number one thing that people wrote on evaluations was, it's good to know I'm not alone. So this is fantastic. Susan, this mirrors another concept and mindset shift that salespeople have to make of when they first start in sales, again, me included. You can tell me if you've ever thought this sales can feel a bit icky and you're, you're having a conversation and you obviously know where you want it to go and and people have a stereotype about salespeople and all this adds up to discomfort and a lot of salespeople start and can never get over that. But the way I got over it and the way that many salespeople get over it is similar to how you just described of if you've got a great product, a great service, if you are personally adding value to the relationship then you should be excited to go and speak and to sell and to interact with these people because you are making a positive difference, not the negative difference that you potentially initially perceived. Well, here, <laughs> that's true because if you don't love what you have to sell, and look, I, I, yeah, it's not just that I sell books because I, I don't take the money, I don't do that, but you know, I'm a speaker. I want to travel all over the world like I have been doing and speak to your companies and corporations. But if that's the first thing that comes out of my mouth when I've got a beverage in one hand and an hors d'oeuvre in another at an event, <laughs> who would want to talk to me? So I'm going to give all of our audience, instead of treating people at any event, even business events, because there's two different skills. One is 
how to work a room and mingle and circulate and socialize. And the second skill is the networking, which is the follow-up. So what you do, and this is something that I've said for years and goes for all of us, especially in sales. The best savvy networkers and salespeople, they do not treat people as prospects. Mm -hmm. They treat them as people. So if you, there's just been a big, interesting, uh, well, we certainly have had it, uh, you know, international news, international sports, um, you know, uh, Dell just has come out with a new album. If there's something in that, shall we say, human interest news, if you don't know about it, you're locked out. So I say, in order to be prepared, read even a content curator. Know what's going on globally. It's now a global community. You Then you have something to talk about. Show up at every event with a couple of talking points that have nothing to do with your product. Nobody really wants any salesperson to say, hello, I have a great product. And even though I'm enthusiastic, <laughs> please excuse me. I'm trying to get the barbecue sauce off my fingers while I am having a, a <laughs> beverage. Yeah, it's, well, a, it's a weird scenario, isn't really it? Weird. So what you do is you go into every room with the intent to meet people, treat them like people. And then as you have that, and it may start a small talk, and please do not ever diminish small talk. That's the way we get to find out what we have in common with people and what our areas of interest are. When you start that talk, it might be that you notice that they're wearing a pin or a fun tie, or you might have bumped into them in the elevator and then you bump into them next to them standing at the bar or the one of the buffet tables. If you start just with off-the-cuff impromptu conversation of two people instead of a salesperson and a potential customer, you will make a connection that really is more solid than if you treat people like they can buy my product. But the other part that you said and alluded to that I like is each one of us has something to offer. So when you walk into any event, meeting, room, party, interview, and you know what you have to offer, and we all do, you have something to give and support and share. And it might be access to someone in your network. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want that? Oh my gosh, I have to introduce you to. When you are the person that helps put people together, people think of you as powerful because you make things happen for other people. So if you're not sure what you have that you can offer people in addition to what you're selling, ask people you know, hey, what do you consider my best quality and what I know? And make a list of it. Because sometimes we don't even know what people think we're good at. Nobody asks me for a recipe, Will, ever. <laughs> oh, but I can tell you where to go, to, what restaurant to eat. Know what your strengths are. Know what you're good at, because that's what and who you bring into every room with you. Your network is part of who enters the room with you. Okay, before final thing before we get into the practical aspects and applications of this, the real world, and as step by step as we can go without going too crazy um, and because I think there's a lot of steps that people miss out and I'll I'll give you my insights and obviously you are the, the mega expert in this so you're going to blow minds with that but uh, massively loaded question you wouldn't be on the show otherwise but can small talk can introduce yourself to people and building those very initial relationships can all this be learnt or is it just the people who were born who were born with massive charisma born with a massive grin on their face are they always just going to be by far and the best at this? Or are these skills that we can learn by the podcast? Then hopefully they're going to go and read your book. And then hopefully they're going to get the sales managers to um, chase them to get you to come and speak at their event. Is this something that we can learn? Well, I sure hope so. Or I've been barking up the wrong tree <laughs> for a lot of years. But also I'm a former teacher. I'm a former public school teacher here in the U.S., both in Chicago and in San Francisco. And I so believe that we can learn whatever we want to learn. 
that information is out there. Yes, there are some people who are naturally what we call charming, but let's take a look at what that is. Charm is the good listener. Charm is the person that has a smile on their face. Charm is the person that makes us feel comfortable. Charm is the person who is interested. Uh, charm is the person that has some wonderful stories that they're willing to share and people they know that they might want to introduce us to. So, and charm is the person who can laugh at themselves, who can say, mm -hmm. gee, I don't know, but hey, maybe I know someone who does. The person that's charming is not that slick charming, though I am thinking of Cary Grant and drooling as <laughs> I speak. We can all learn that. We can all learn that if we will take the focus off of ourself and think of what would people want. Let's think of this. Hey, here's your homework. All of our listeners, think of a person who you think of as charming and write some mental notes. Of course, I'm a school teacher who says pick up a pencil and actually write these notes. <laughs> write out what do they do that makes you think they're charming. How I know that this is I had a client he was the VP of sales of a big insurance company they went to a trade show and the forty thousand dollars they basically threw out because they paid for the staff to go there but they had too much happy at happy hour and they forgot the business cards they collected so they brought me in and here here's what he told me that he was he said he thought he was pathetically shy as a teenager what he did is he looked around and he had a coach who he thought was really outgoing and he started observing him taking notes what did he do how did he do it who did he talk to and what he did is he began to pattern himself and mm -hmm. learn from this coach and start doing what he did when he told me he used to be shy I was shocked so I'm saying the same thing about charm look at people who you find charming what do they do oh I can do that Hmm, let me try it. Oh, look, I met someone because I tried this tech. Oh, I'm going to do it a little bit more. <laughs> so we can learn this. If, if I didn't believe we can learn, uh, really, I would have no faith in the entire education system. But the truth is, I think people can be educated on what they want to be educated on. I have no technical skills. Oh, my goodness, awful. I am a, such an early adopter of social media that even my friends mm -hmm. are shocked blogger 11 years, LinkedIn almost 11, Twitter. Twitter sends me um, happy anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> You've been on eight years. Oh, my goodness. We can learn what we want to learn. Now, I actually don't ever want to learn how to make a souffle. I can't tell you how it doesn't interest me, but I want to learn how to use Periscope. And it's out there. So, yes, you know, I have a lot of videos on my site on YouTube that have little, how do you talk to the big kahuna? How do you remember names, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Go to places that you think have information. I think YouTube and Vimeo are great sources. So yes, we can learn, but here's the caveat. Only if you inherently and inside your guts want to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to link to some of the videos because I know your YouTube channel, I'm a subscriber, and there's some great content on there. So we'll link to some of those specifics. But I want to come back to the very practical aspect of this now. I don't know if there's a step-by-step -step process, but we've covered a couple of steps already, perhaps, of before you even leave the house, you go online, you get a couple of general bits of news that you can small talk with people about at the event that you're going to. I want to start by when you walk into the room. Okay, I'm going to, can go I, I'm just going to say, before, I forgot to say this, before you even leave to go to the event, besides uh -huh. getting information that you can make conversation with, um, and this is what I'm known for, prepare and practice a seven to nine second self-introduction. It's not a 30 second elevator pitch. Believe me, there's no elevator in the world that anyone wants to be in with you going on about yourself 30 or even 15 seconds. It's a seven to nine second pleasantry. And if you prepare that and think of how am I going to introduce myself, what you'll actually be doing when you introduce yourself is demonstrating what the other person should say because they might be shyer than you and they might not have listened to the podcast or read my book. So... It's seven to nine seconds for your self-introduction. 
you give in that a, um, a link to why you're at that event. You'll introduce yourself differently at a social event than at a sales event that at a friend's wedding. So you customize that uh, link to whatever the event is because you have to give people context for why you're there so they know how to talk to you. And the third benefit, the third um, trait comes from my friend Patricia Fripp, who's originally from Winborn on the Dorset, who said to me, Roanne, tell people to not give their title, but to give the benefit of what they do. Uh-huh. And you we've give... spoken to Patricia on the podcast before as oh, well. Oh, yes. Right. Well, she's one of my best friends. Yes, you did. Oh, I did see that. Right. So she said, give people the benefit of what you do. And if you say it, and this is the Susan Roanne version, with some humor or a little bit of lightheartedness and a smile on your face, people will want to talk to you. But you give them a benefit and they could say, it's like people say to me, oh, what do you do? Well, I, I turn people into mingling mavens. Okay. Oh, what's a mingling maven? Then I'm invited to say what I do, what that is, and that I wrote how to work a room. And then here is the key that the s- smart and savvy mingling mavens do. You mm-hmm. stop and you turn to that person and say, and what about you? And then you've invited them to talk a little bit about themselves, and then you're in a conversation. So give a benefit of what you do. Say it with a good smile on your face, seven to nine seconds, and link it to the specific event you're at. That's what your homework is. That's before you leave. And when you get into that room, you want me to tell you what to do when you get to that room? You blow my mind here. Let's just pause on that, and let me just um, go over it so that my it's, it's sinking into my brain of, you're giving what you're doing by doing that is you're giving people a framework to reply to, yes. which takes the pressure off them and engages that conversation without it being awkward. Exactly. In fact, the research, I'm a big believer. In, when you write books, as far as I'm concerned, you also should go to the social science research to make sure that what yep. you're saying is true. And then I'm from old school, which is, and then you actually quote and um acknowledge your sources which is why you'll hear me talk about dr zimbardo and dr adele shealy because well look my my background i've got a chemistry degree susan so you speak in my language here (laughs) yeah oh yeah okay so you've got it's like you got to get the facts ma'am the facts so you what you just said is the exact nugget you are helping people who might be more nervous more uncomfortable not as uh forthcoming giving them a framework for how to respond to you and what they should say. And what the research shows is 90% of the people will respond in kind. So if you give your name and the benefit of what you do, then they know they can give their name. Now, I always say you give your first, you know, both names. Sometimes a person will respond with just their first name and you go, well, well, you flunked that part of it. (laughs) But it's fair to say, Oh, could you help me out? Would you mind giving me your full name? And if their name is difficult to pronounce, say it and then say, could you, could you say it again? I want to make sure I get it right. See, what I think is wonderful about people in the UK, very polite language, very good manners. And in that way, it, it invites people to respond in a positive way. If we try to save time, by saving nanoseconds to get to the point, we're not really being as gracious as we should or could be. I totally agree on that front. And I, so I was going to say it, you, you preempted my uh, oh, question sorry. when we first started recording, or before we start recording of your surname. So I'd seen it that it was spelt uh, R-O capital A-N and it was, it was in my list of questions to confirm that with you. And I don't, and but I know some people would feel that, oh no, I don't know the, the guest name. And I've been on YouTube and I'd, I'd heard you say it and I'd heard other people say it, but I just wanted to confirm it so that I didn't make a mistake when I said it back, uh, knowing the, the introduction to this show and all that. But I know some people would have been really hesitant of asking a question like that. But I know from my perspective, if someone asked me something similar, I would almost take it as a compliment that they were taking the extra effort 
to make sure that everything was right. I wouldn't see it as a negative whatsoever. No, no. It, you know what? It's not a negative. What people love is to hear their name said correctly. Now, I mine is said wrong a, a lot of times, <laughs> but you made it really easy and you were interested, and that's important. And you know, now that we have uh, such a diverse and global community, it really is important that we say people's names correctly. They do want to say it so, and and that people will sometimes have help you practice. That shows interest. That mm-hmm. shows respect, and you can never go wrong showing interest and respect. Definitely. Well, Susan, we are running out of time here rapidly, and so because uh, I could talk to you about this all day, you're you're a great person to interview here. But I want to keep on with the practical side of things. So we've got. Before you before you set off, you're looking for a bit of news, a bit of small talk, um, ammunition. You prepared this seven to nine second mini pitch about yourself, which leads the other person and enables them to comfortably reply back to you. The step that I feel like we're missing here is that initial high, and that could be the most awkward part of the whole thing potentially, or it could be the thing that most people would be nervous about because it's it's that step you're you're being slightly vulnerable perhaps and you're putting yourself out there and i know from experience and it doesn't really bother me anymore but i said as a young salesperson it used to of it's very easy when someone comes over and says hi to you to have that conversation and then you're in the conversation you, you flow in and you're 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 asking questions and you can keep it going and you can conclude it but that initial momentum i always found was the most difficult thing what is the best way to you walk in a room you see someone and you want to approach them is it as simple as clear with your mind not thinking about it just going up saying hi i'm will and then you jump into your seven seconds Uh, how about this you know sometimes we can say our name at the end but if you're standing next to someone whether you're standing at the bar or the buffet or uh, you're in a seminar and they're sitting next to you. Um, sometimes we don't say our name at first. Sometimes we'll say, hey, isn't that an interesting whatever? S- off the cuff about the venue, about what's going on, mm-hmm. about the organization that started. But when you see someone in a room, and I'm going to suggest this, the person standing alone will have the exact reaction you mentioned, Will. They will feel so grateful that you've come over uh-huh. and talked to them. So this is what your homework is for the rest of your life, all of you listening. <laughs> I know I give homework. It's my least attractive quality, but you can take the teacher out of the classroom. You can't take the classroom out of the teacher. Anytime you go somewhere and you see someone standing alone, it is smart, savvy to go over to that person alone because they will be the person who's going to be the most responsive. And they might even be so shy that they'll be a little like, why are you coming over to me? But the reality is it's also kind because we've all been in that room, Will, where we've stood alone and we are so grateful when someone notices. So you can have a successful, wonderful, um, effective time in any room mingling if you just talk to the people standing alone, that's number one. Number two, it is hard to go over to people. But now that you've listened to this podcast and you've heard what mm-hmm. Will and I have had to say, just know that no one's in that room, and I can promise you this, nobody gets <laughs> dressed to go into that room, whatever that room is, is, to stand alone and feel like, oh my gosh, I am such a twerp. No one wants to talk to me. They would be grateful. And I don't care if you're talking to the CEO. I've spoken to CEOs, and you know what they've said? They are part of that 90% shy. But the one Mm -hmm. tip that I give that they say is effective, and I want to give that to you, is instead of acting like a guest at any event, meeting, conference, party, bring me a drink, uh, you know, tell me amusing stories, make me have a good time, This is what you're going to do from now on because I will be sitting on your shoulder whispering in your ear. (laughs) Act like the host. Now, we all know what a good host does. A good host extends themselves, welcomes you, shows interest. 
And how about this? When they're talking to you, they actually look at you, not over your shoulder to see who else is in the room. And yeah. please, whether it's millennials or people um, of all ages, leave your devices in your pockets. Nobody is going to come over to you in a room if you're checking your texts or emails. For sure. Well, I think that is an amazing point to leave the this part of the show and wrap that part of the show up with Susan. And just before you tell us a little bit about your book and the speaking that you do, I've got a couple of questions that I ask everyone that comes on the show. Sure. The first one is, and I know you and both of these questions aren't necessarily for out and out salespeople. You'll have you'll be able to answer them, I'm sure. But for other than your own book and the, the other work that you do. What is one book or resource that you'd recommend to the Salesman Podcast audience? Oh, I would definitely recommend Stand Out by Dory Clark. Um, it is a wonderful book. It's like, how do you stand out from the crowd? How, And, you know, to me, it's they originally called How to Work a Room, How to Shine in a Crowd in the UK. But How to Stand Out is really an excellent book. And Dory also wrote for people contemplating career changes, reinventing you, but both of her books, but standout is a standout because you'll have competition for whatever it is you sell, but how do you stand out and become the singular person people know? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We'll link to that in the show notes over at salesman.red of this episode. And final question for me, Susan, Again, this is something that I ask everyone that comes on the show. I know you are not a quote unquote salesperson, but you've you've sold book deals, you've obviously got books, you're selling, you're speaking, so you'll be able to answer it, I'm sure. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give her to help her become better at sales? Uh, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... I think that that would be to understand, which I do now, which I didn't in the beginning, is that we are all salespeople. Now, when I was a teacher and I started my career change workshops, by then I understood that teachers were salespeople and that we had those skills. And you'll find some of the best salespeople were former educators. And I said in my career change seminar for teachers, we're great salespeople. How wonderful is it to sell a product or service instead of saying, oh, here's the chemistry chart, the periodic table. <laughs> um, let me sell you all eight parts of speech and where to put your commas. That's a tough sell. Yeah. But when you have a product or a service and really what we're all doing, people don't buy for, from companies. They really don't. And that's why the face-to-face -face is so important for everyone in sales. People buy from people. So whatever you can do face to face, meet people online, follow up, go to a go to meeting, go to wherever, go to your professional association, whatever you can do to meet people face to face. And then here's the magic. This is where the networking comes in. Follow up and stay in touch. And if I might add one more tip from um, obviously opinionated Susan Roanne. <laughs> Stay in touch with people when you need nothing from them and have nothing to sell them. Pick up the phone, send the email that says, how are you, that has to do with them and not you. When you stay in touch with people when you need nothing, they'll be more interested in hearing from you when you have something to sell or need something. Definitely. Brilliant stuff. Well, with that, Susan, it's been a pleasure talking to you. For everyone who wants to know more, I want you to tell us where we can find your book, a little bit about it, and then for the people who want to take it a bit further, how they can hire you to speak. Okay, you can find my book in bookstores because I do like to support bookstores. That's They made me a best-selling author. Um, you can also find it online. You can come to my website, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E.com or howtoworkaroom.com, and you can find a way to buy the book online. Uh, I don't sell them off of my site. But also, um, the other thing you could do is get it through audible.com if you prefer to listen while you're driving or at the gym. And it's also available as an ebook, so we've made it in any way 
Plus, there are other books that I've written that you might find even as interesting. But you can go to my site. You can go to your bookstore. And we always like to support local communities. And going to a local community bookstore is a good thing. If you want to hire me to speak, I am available. I love it. Anywhere in the world, I'm there. Uh, you can go to my website, susanroan.com, S-U-S-A-N-R-O-A-N-E.com. You can email me. Susan at SusanRoan.com. You can Skype me, um, but I think we need to set up an appointment in case you're in a, another time zone, but that's Susan.Roan. And how about this for old fashioned? Give me a call. I've got a telephone and it's a landline and the connection will be clear. It's in the U.S. in San Francisco, 415-461-391. One five, call me. And if you have a big question, you know, well, if someone listening has a question that's a burning question, email me and we'll come up with an answer and a solution. I'm happy to answer. I don't want you to listen to this and say, oh, I had just a question to, that I wanted to ask. Feel free to do that. But on my site, there are a lot of blog posts that will answer your questions. But if you have one, mm -hmm. get in touch with me. I'm the former teacher. We'll teach you the right answer. <laughs> amazing stuff well for anyone who is trying to frantically write some of that down as they're running on a treadmill or uh, hopefully not driving because that's dangerous <laughs> we, we, we'll link to all that that you mentioned then susan over in the show notes over at salesman.red and with that i just want to thank you for your time and your insights and i want to thank you for coming on the salesman podcast well thank you i have enjoyed it and i so appreciate how forthcoming you've been it's been wonderful and there we have it. I just want to thank Suzanne again for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. I want to thank you for listening. The listener, as always, there'll be no show without you guys tuning in. And yeah, I appreciate it, guys. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. <laughs>